Hey folks, Steve here with another Korea Fire and Ice video. In this video, we'll be getting into turn two. Uh, before we get started proper, I did want to cover a couple of topics that sort of uh, came out of the last video when we did turn one. Um, and I'll try to move quickly here, but I think there's a lot to discuss, and it's not an easy thing to kind of talk through. So, um, in terms of rule screw-ups, I think one thing that I that had slipped my mind, even though I had read it, I was cognizant of it, was that no matter if a Republic of Korea unit was routed or not, none of them had Zox uh, on that first turn due to surprise. Um, I think I did treat them uh, at first, especially around this area over here, as having Zox, which essentially cost the communist forces maybe a slightly better attack in some places where instead of a prepared attack maybe it could have been or a hasty attack it might have been a prepared attack or something but i don't think it was that impactful really it's just you lose one movement point um, i don't think it's a big deal uh somebody in the comment section had mentioned about you know hey you're you're not you know you're overspending your supply uh because your hqs can activate four units and uh, I did respond in that comment, but I'm going to speak more broadly to it uh, because I do want folks to understand why I did some of the things that I did. So when you activate a unit, um, for sure, I think, especially later in the game, you're going to want to activate your four units per HQ activation when you can, right? Because you need to do a lot with the forces that you have, and you really do want to have those supported attacks where you have two to three units attacking one hex. I did not do that here for a very specific reason. One of those reasons is that, uh, one, however much supply we spend would be replenished during the monthly turn that we're going to do here on camera in, uh, in a few minutes. So I started with 12. I could easily have spent down to zero if I really wanted to, and it would have made zero difference. Now, my supply expenditure was from me repeatedly refreshing HQs. I did that because with each activation, I was usually, though not always, activating one unit instead of four. Now, why, why did I do that? Well, there's a, there was a reason. All this was intentional. My thought process was, if I activate one unit and it conducts you know, one attack or you know, it does the attack against the enemy... Um, I'm going to cause some amount of losses, and because the infantry, uh, or I'm sorry, the artillery and the tank support is so overwhelmingly in the communist's favor that even a one-unit-to-one-unit combat is going to have a very high likelihood of providing a very large loss margin against the South Koreans. Now, what doesn't help is if I throw three units against one unit and I get, you know, plus 20 or whatever, and that loss maximum is five by default. Well, if I spend a lot of units and I get, you know, 20 to two, that 18 difference still gets whittled down to five. So how do I most effectively make use of the units on the board? Well, I would rather have <clears throat> the capability to get five loss factors multiple times than 20 loss factors in one combat that I can't actually make use of. So the first unit activated approaches the enemy, conducts a combat, inflicts, you know, maybe three or to, you know, three to five loss factors. Well, what does the South Korean player have to do? Well, they're going to drain some replacements, they're going to retreat, they're going to become routed, they're going to get weaker. Then I spend a supply point, I refresh the HQ, I activate the next unit. That next unit now surges forward, can get further along down the road than the initial unit, which is now spent, you know, the first unit I activated, that unit can now make use of the fact that the enemy's retreated, can get closer and further down the road, and attack again, further reducing the resources of the opposite player with another combat that is just as good as the last combat, and again inflicting lost points that are more easily lost by the player and not in excess of what can be counted in a given combat. And so by doing that, you know, I was able to get it to, like out here, where I had, a you know, forced the... UN player to actually, you know, the losses were still so significant for a single combat that they they had to just eliminate the unit. And by doing that, I could then activate a second unit that could move further out than if I had activated them all together 
and they did a combined combat. Now, there's certainly an advantage to doing those combined combats on that first turn. So for instance, you know, creating a situation where a unit could not retreat because it was stuck between Zoks, that might have been useful, right? We've got a couple of South Korean units that are still alive because they could actually retreat, um, but I zeroed them out on replacements, I had forced them back, and I had allowed my units enough space that they could uh, advance a decent bit. Now, I think that's still sound strategy here. I think in a couple of places I could have done things better to make it so that this unit is gone and I'm you know, further up towards Seoul. But I think the broad idea that I want to spread out some of my activations um, makes sense here. And again, it's because of the supplies. I have so many. I have 12. Um, and if I count the units on the board, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I mean, I could have activated... I basically could have activated every unit, every combat unit, individually if I wanted to with the HQs and still refreshed all the HQs to full, essentially, right? I had enough supply to do that, and you'll see in this next monthly turn, we're going to reset a lot of that stuff back up to full supply. So anything I would have spent in the first turn is really just, you know, spend as much as you want, effectively, um, <clears throat> down to zero if you really want to, and it's even hard to spend all 12. So that was the reason for what I did. Um, you know, doing the sequential activations, um, it, like, but as I mentioned previously, I suspect later in the game that will prove less useful uh, because I will need to activate a broader set of units across a real front line where I need those bonuses. But for now, because things are so wide open and we're operating with that surprise, um, I just structured my operational advance differently. So it was by design. There was a purpose for it. Probably won't always do that. Um, okay, now before we get into the monthly turn, there's one other topic I want to discuss, and that is the objective marker stuff. So the objective marker system in this game, I feel like there's either nuance to it or it is overly confusing to what I want to be doing in a given game context. So Here's what I gathered so far. Me coming into this hex was probably a mistake, but not for the reasons you th might think. Um, so we still have a South Korean HQ here, and we have a unit right there. We will need to do something about those guys. We will want to probably take control of Seoul, but here's the thing. We are able to place objective markers where... According to the current rules, 3.0 rules, so if there's something amiss here, then the rules would need to be amended. But you can only place objective markers during the victory phase where there are enemy units in towns or cities at a high level, right? There's some nuances to how you place them in towns, but broadly speaking, you do need to put them where there's an enemy unit, except for the capitals, uh, Pyongyang and Seoul, respectively. In those cases, as long as that part of the city is controlled by your opponent, with or without a unit, you can place objective markers there. So, um, while we dealt with this one, let's assume we knock this unit out, he's gone, we leave that hex alone, and maybe the HQ gets displaced or moved or something by the Allies. Well, if the North Koreans leave this hex unoccupied, it's technically still controlled by the UN forces, even if there's no units around it or near it or whatever. And as long as we leave it alone and we don't enter it, we are technically allowed to place more objective markers over there. And we can keep doing that turn after turn. For our victory phase action, we can choose to put the objective in that hex. And we can eventually keep doing that, <laughs> I guess as, as much as we feel like we want to risk it, and then we can choose to reveal all of those objective markers, assuming we have a unit adjacent to them. So maybe we leave this guy here to occupy Seoul. And then, then on future turns, we can spend our victory phase action claiming those victory points. So I'm just going to grab three at random. So let's say we did that for the next three turns. I could, and this would take seven turns to execute, <clears throat> I could pick up nine victory points by doing this. 
I'm, I'm effectively using a part of Seoul that is technically UN controlled, but I did not take control of purposefully, and I'm using it as a objective bank to plop a whole bunch down and pull them back up and, and claim them. Um, whenever I think I, I've gained as many as I want. And you only need 21 to reach an automatic victory. So I'd pick up, you know, n you know, nine there. I already have three, then we'd be at 12. And then somehow I need to pick up nine more to, to win the game. And, and there's other, uh, you know, other ways to get victory points. I was trying to think like, okay, well, is that a good, is that a good thing to do? It seems like it's a good thing to do. If you want victory points, and that this is where it gets complicated. Like, if you want victory points, that's something to do. Um, it's awfully gamey, and I'm not sure it makes sense, right? Why, why would the North Koreans not just take all of Seoul? That's what you would do, right? You would capture. It's better to have it than not have it, in theory, right? That's what you would think. But that weird case, the way those objective marker replacement rules are set up, like, that's your incentive. The other thing is... If your opponent intentionally keeps his units out of cities and towns, then you can't place objective markers anywhere else anyhow. And I might do that as the the UN player. I might move my units um, out of uh, these cities down here in the south so that more objective markers can't be placed there. Um, that seems odd, doesn't it, right? Um, and I can understand, like, okay, you don't want to just give freebie uh, objectives, maybe, but if you keep the unit requirement there, you're, you're going to get in the gamey stuff like that, and it weirds me out. Um, now, let's say that there wasn't a unit requirement. You could just place it in any old city or any old town. That would maybe force the UN player to defend those areas, but now the incentive, if I don't want my opponent to get objective markers that they can get for victory points, would be to leave those places entirely for some reason and leave them be. And then forcing again the communist player to either place those objective markers in Seoul in the weird bank that they've set up or not place any at all. Um, and then the North Korean player, the communist player, will lose victory points for not being able to take any of those actions. It's awfully weird. It, it really, truly, I would, I, I ask that you look at page 15 of the rules, the 3.0 rules, and, and you read the 6.2.3 section. I don't know if I'm missing something, it, it, but it seems awfully strange the way it's structured. And I get, I guess I tr am trying to understand the purpose, right? You, you can set objectives, you can pick up objectives, you can win them, you can get victory points. You do want to be ahead in victory points by the end of the game, that's how you win, but how do you meter getting the victory points? It's just so odd, this weird behavior, right? And I'm, and I'm playing gamey for both sides, right? That I'm, I'm in a gamey way going to avoid capturing the southeast uh, hex of Seoul to use as an objective bank. The UN player is going to, in a gamey way, keep his units out of city so that ob objective markers can't be placed there. Now, um, the designer on Consum World has said that, you know, you know, do that and see what happens. Like, there's some bad thing to doing that, but I still don't quite understand why it's a bad thing. Now, the one key piece of the puzzle is perhaps the foreign intervention and foreign aid phase. So the way that works is the higher you are in victory points, the more bonuses your enemy will get in terms of replacements uh, and, and other stuff. But you get a victory point for doing it. You know, they... They get stuff, but you get a victory point. So here's here's my problem. Um, it, if the idea is you don't want to be too far out ahead in victory points, okay, fair enough. You, you try to keep it metered and low. You want to be ahead, but you don't want to be overwhelmingly winning because then what? Your opponent will have an overwhelming advantage, and then they're going to push you back and yet still have problems gaining victory points because the objective marker system is weird and confusing. <laughs> and they may not be able to get victory points anyway because of the same gamey strategy of avoiding, um, you know, avoiding putting units in towns and cities. So, so we pick up some victory points. Sure, they may get some aid, 
Uh, but if we just keep them from being able to place objective markers, they never get victory points anyway. They can get all the aid they want, and we keep increasing our victory point score until game victory? Like, I, I'm, I'm so confused by how it's set up because it's making me think about the game not in terms of a military victory, but like I'm gaming a system now instead of fighting what's immediately on the board and saying, okay, these are my obvious goals. Now, for the North Koreans, they still have an obvious goal of taking these supply port uh, box harbors um, like Incheon and, and Pusan, but there's this whole other very distracting element of these objective markers. It, and I, and I, I am trying to keep my mind open to what is this meant to do? How is this supposed to be metering the game experience? Um, but I think the, the placement rules are written in such a way that it just invites me to try to make gamey decisions because ultimately the carrot and stick here is like, I want victory points, I want to win the game. Even if I don't want to be too far ahead in victory points, I still need to be ahead in victory points to win. You know, it's like if, if you want your opponent to be a little bit ahead in victory points, that's true up until you count final victory and then they win the game, right? So you can't actually focus on letting them have victory points for too long. So somewhere in there, the, the game has to reach some logical point where, like, the things that you're doing and why you're doing them need to line up in a logical way, and I'm, and I'm trying to find that place, and I'm just having trouble with it. So th this objective system, to me, is distracting from me fighting the Korean War, because what I'm fighting is the, how do I get victory points the right way within this little mini-game um, when I would rather be focused on taking territory and defending territory and all of that. And, and so it's like, you know, if I think about how OCS Korea does it, you know, OCS Korea adjudicates victory based on different defense lines that each side is trying to control. And that makes sense to me, right? You, you want to control a certain amount of territory. And if you're, you know, way south of Seoul, uh, as the North Koreans by the end of the game and the, the final turn, then that's like a pretty good communist victory. If you're way up in North Korea beyond Pyongyang as the UN forces by the end of the game, that's a that's a pretty good UN victory, right? That that makes sense from a, like, where is this all going to end up kind of thing. But just knowing that the game is going to go all the way down to the south, it's going to go all the way up north, and then somehow we're going to end the game somewhere around here well, okay, you know, it, then the, the victor depends on these victory points. And the victory points right now don't seem like, uh, besides some of the, like, event, you know, combat gives you victory points sometimes. Winning air battles will give you victory points sometimes. But when it comes to territory and objectives, it is it feels very disconnected um, from what I'm actually trying to achieve or what I feel like I should be trying to achieve. So we're, we're going to, I'm going to ask that if you're watching this, that you monitor, you help me monitor the situation. You let me know if I'm making a, a oversight to some degree, um, and help me help me line up my logical desire versus the, what the game is telling me I should be doing. Um, I, I, I get, again, I can understand only wanting to be winning by a little bit, so you can eke out a victory without foreign intervention. Um, but even then, the actual mechanics of how you place objective markers. And when you're allowed to, and, and how does that work, is awfully strange. Again, I'm not going to capture all of Seoul, and I'm not going to defend in cities, because the objective marker rules incentivize me to act that way. And I find that very strange. But okay, that, that's enough of that. I realize we're wasting like 20 minutes of the video on this intro stuff, but I think it's very critically important to the rest of the game because I'm going to be operating on these understandings of the systems, and that may influence what I do on map and, and what I explain to you guys. So, um, Okay, so let's start talking monthly phase for July 1950. Okay, so now that I'm done <laughs> explaining my great confusion over the objective marker system, which I still hope I, it will click and I'll have a eureka moment, um, but for now, it will continue to be mysterious. Uh, let's go ahead and get into the actual turn, right? We have our first monthly phase. Uh, and just as a reminder, what does that look like? Well, here in our handy-dandy sequence of play, we have weather, uh, foreign intervention, foreign aid, 
infrastructure and supply, aircraft recovery and reinforcement, aircraft repair, air force commitment, determine air support, strategic air missions, and top cover. So, gosh, a lot of air stuff, right? Um, by and large, mostly air stuff. Sorry, you lost focus there for a second. Okay, so we're going to do weather check. So what we do is we look uh, over at the uh, track for the month. It says that July 1950 has a 30% chance of uh, rain. So we will do that. Now, 30% means we're rolling a 10-sided die. Basically, um, I don't think there's any you know, tricky, tricky bits with that. Um, and because it's not a winter turn, uh, there's no way to get snow, obviously, so it's just gonna be a die roll. So a three or less, and it is rainy weather. Rolled a five, so the weather remains clear. Uh, we'll assume that that's all goodness for the North Koreans at this point. So then we move into the foreign intervention and foreign aid phase. Um, okay, so we're going to check to see if there is foreign intervention in the war. Any foreign intervention will be on the side currently losing. So that would be, in this case, the South Koreans, since they have no victory points. Uh, the player without victory points checks for foreign intervention. It is mandatory unless both interventions have already occurred. So let's see here. So we, we're going to skip past, I'm um, on page 16 of the rules, if you want to follow along. We're going to skip past 7.2.1.1. We're going to go do the 7.2.1.2, which is for the UN checks, since that's what we're dealing with here. The UN player chooses whether to attempt to obtain Republic of China uh, intervention or atomic release before rolling the die. Well, I, it feels a little early for atomic release, so we're probably going to look at Republic of China. To do so, we would roll a D6 with a minus 1 DRM if the communists have 10 or more victory points. They do not. Uh, we would, uh, the Republic of China would intervene on a roll of zero or less, um, and I think that's the only, yeah, those are the only modifiers. So I'm going to go ahead and save us some time, right? If a minus one doesn't apply and you need a zero or less, even if we roll the one, a one is a one. So right now there is no way for the Republic of China to intervene and looking at the modifiers for atomic release which need communist victory points to be 15 or more for the Soviets having intervened. There's no way for atomic release to occur here either. So no foreign intervention, but we are now going to look at foreign aid, which will matter. Uh, the player without victory points may ask for foreign aid. So this is uh, voluntary. We don't have to do this. Um, you can ask for both intervention and aid. Uh, Okay, so right now, the communist forces have four victor or three victory points, rather, which would mean that uh, if we do the foreign aid, it would be based on these values here. So the enemy, let's see if we can get that to focus. If the enemy VP is equal one to four, we would give the communists another victory point, and we would get two infrastructure to our replacements. We would add... Uh, two UN replacements, two our replacements, infrastructure and supply track. We would add two tank and two artillery support to our support level track. And may choose either to remove one poor unit designation or add an elite. <clears throat> well, I guess the question is, do we give up a victory point to get that cool stuff? Um... I don't know if there's a reason not to at this point. I mean, so here, here's where that objective marker business comes in again. Um, if we had more victory points as the communists, that would give even more support to uh, the UN forces. Again, at the cost of a single victory point, but that single victory point buys you a lot more here. Um, so I think we'll, we'll go ahead and do it. Um, I, I think, I mean, I'm trying to... Trying to see here. Um, ah. 
Yeah, I guess we'll do it. Yeah, we, we will ask for foreign aid. The South Koreans are like, hey man, this sucks. So, North Koreans get a victory point. Communists get a victory point. They are now up to four because of this action. And now we're going to add two infrastructure to the replacements uh, track. So, infrastructure goes up from five to seven. I realize I'm walking away from the camera, so um, let's just address this the easiest way possible. Whoa! I should have stopped recording. Oh, well, you guys are along for the ride. Um, okay, so we add two infrastructure. We're going to add two UN replacements, which uh, I believe UN is blue. So we're going to add two replacements. This is going to make up for the fact that the North Korean or South Koreans don't have any replacements now. Uh, we're going to add two tank and two artillery support to the support track. So artillery and tank go to the two value down here. And we can remove one poor unit or add an elite unit. Um, well, I think what we'll do is we will make... Uh, hmm. We will make this unit in Seoul, or maybe, I don't know. Um, let's make this guy down in Taejeon a elite unit. So we made him an elite. He's pretty far away, has a chance to be useful later, so he just starts as elite, and that's what we're gonna do. Okay, uh, that is it for foreign intervention. The next part of the turn, uh, the monthly phase, is the infrastructure and supply. So what we're going to end up doing is we're going to take the supply marker and we're going to bring it up to our infrastructure marker, which again is now 7, um, which is a pretty straightforward thing to do. But now we have the option to uh, spend some supply before the next turn to kind of get situated. Um, and as I look to... Let's see. Um, what I'm wondering is, are we gonna get, are we gonna get more reinforcements <clears throat> for infrastructure? Not. It doesn't look like right now we will. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't look like it, like it right away. So uh, now the UN forces have seven infrastructure and seven supply points. Now we have supply point expenditure. So. Uh, this is where we can spend some of the supply early to get uh, our HQs flipped and different things. So what can you spend it on? Um, well, you can uh, flip spent HQs. You can repair airfield markers where you would have airfields. You can repair uh, improved airfields. You can upgrade an airfield to an improved airfield. And you can place a prepared position marker uh, where there's a friendly unit uh, that that costs some supply as well. Now, um, we don't have a huge amount of supply as the UN forces, but I do think it makes sense to try to get our HQs up to snuff. So a UN player that spends to refresh a HQ with a line of commu communication in South Korea is one supply point. So we do that for both the... Uh, HQs on the map right now. There are two. Whoops. Just bumped my plexiglass, which is terrible. And now things are going to be slightly skewed. There we go. Back to normal. Okay, so we're going to spend two supply to do that. That brings us back down to five. But now we have HQs that are uh, fixed. Um, and then let's see. Is there anything else we can do? So the other I, the other question, I guess, is do we spend any supply to create a prepared position? Well, we could try to uh, do something up in Seoul, I guess, and try to reinforce this area over here, but I don't know that that's really worthwhile. Um, 
And as soon as you move a unit, that goes away. So I don't think right now we're going to create any prepared positions with our supply. I think we're going to use them to activate units and try to pull back into some something resembling of a defensive perimeter somewhere. So the UN won't do any of that. Um, and that's it for the, uh, the UN supply phase, infrastructure supply phase. Now we'll do the communists. Okay, so uh, for the communists, they don't have any change in their infrastructure level, so we're going to take our supply and bring it up to the infrastructure level of 8. See, and that's why it was kind of fine if I spent out my supply last turn and used it to activate each unit individually if I really wanted to by refreshing those HQs, because we were just going to get it uh, back to full. Oh, I'm sorry. Whoops. Supply goes up to 12, not 8. That's the replacements. Um, so yeah, we go up to 12 supply uh, because of that. So all good there. Next, do we want to spend anything to refresh HQs? Well, here's some convenient information to be aware of. Uh, a communist player flipping a spent HQ in North Korea costs zero. And all of our uh, HQs... Well, I spent to, you know, to flip them anyway because it didn't really matter. This guy, who's still in North Korea, flips for free. So all of our HQs uh, on the North Korean side, on the communist side, are refreshed for free. Um, do we want to improve an airfield? Well, I don't know if it does a whole lot for us to do that. Um, it might be valuable to do it now early, just so we have it. Um, I think it depends on if we're going to get any plane reinforcements, and I don't think we're going we're going to. Um, so I don't think we're going to spend any supply to improve our airfield. I think we'll leave it as is. Um, well, uh, let's just do it for fun. Sure, let's just try it out. So we're going to spend uh, two supply. So we're down to ten, which, which should be ample to do what we need to do, I hope. And we're going to flip the airfield on our North Korean airfields box from its normal side. And I'll just show you on camera, normal side to improved side. There you go. And that just functionally means it's able to uh, have more planes operate off of it. But Right now we kind of have, you know, we're already at max, so what's the point of doing that? I, I'm just going to invest some supply early where we have an advantage so that uh, our airfield's in better shape. Of course, if the Allied bombing totally wrecks that airfield to crap, then this was a waste. But we're going to try it out, just for fun. Let's just see what happens. Um, okay, so we're done with that. Now we have the aircraft recovery and reinforcement phase. Both players return friendly aircraft and air mission boxes to their respective available aircraft boxes. Well, that's only really one side. So uh, both the North Korean Air Force units go back to their available box. That's way over here on the other side of the table. We'll, we'll bother to show that. That's pretty straightforward. Um, and now aircraft scheduled to enter the game as reinforcements during this month are placed in their respective available aircraft boxes or... If naval aircraft in the 7th Fleet Carrier's box, airfield scheduled to enter the game as reinforcements are placed in the appropriate box. And if the 7th Fleet is coming in, it arrives during this phase, and you can place it in either C-Zone box. Okay, so, a lot of reading. This is actually where the U.S. is going to get its air units, according to the reinforcement chart. And this is in uh, the same section of the rules as setup where we can see what the monthly reinforcements are. So for July 1950, you can see it's all UN oriented. Let me get that, there we go. So we're gonna get a whole bunch of units in the available aircraft box. We're gonna get several carrier groups into the Seventh Fleet Carriers box. We're gonna get that Seventh Fleet marker and we're gonna get five improved airfields in Japan. Um, so a lot of good stuff. So let me switch it over to the uh, UN player air display, and we'll talk through it. Okay, so here is the uh, UN air display after we've uh, set the reinforcements actually on the uh, the display. 
So obviously a lot busier than the communist display uh, that we looked at before during setup. So we've now added five improved airfields in the Jap uh, Japan airfields box down here in the bottom right. So this is the game representing um, all of the airfield basing uh, that the Americans had um, because of the occupation of Japan and the post-war era and all that kind of stuff. So they have not just airfields, but improved airfields and multiple airfields. So that's five improved airfields to the one on the communist side right now. And the way it'll work is that those improved airfields will allow a certain number of planes to operate off, off of them. Um, and we surely have a whole bunch of planes to do that with. So in our available aircraft box here, we have uh, all kinds of goodness showing up here. Uh, you can see we have a total of nine planes that have come on. Uh, many of these are uh, going to be uh, predominantly air-to-air -air capability units, um, by and large and for the most part. But these four down here are going to be uh, better at bombing missions uh, for the most part. So there's some combination of air-to-air -air ability. There's some combination of tactical missions. And really, what you need to be able to do is either match up the, the pictures on the counter here on the capability chart, or you're going to read in the very, very small print you know, just what this is. So that's a B-26, kind of faint in the corner there, B-26. Um, so a B-26 uh, can do strategic missions, such as infrastructure strike and airfield strike with a three value. Not quite as good as a B-29, but uh, that's what that have. But we do have a number of B-29s who can do uh, better, right? So that's kind of the way to look at that. We also have... Uh, down here on the uh, Seventh Fleet Carriers box, uh, carrier specific planes. So these are planes operating from uh, uh, ships of the Seventh Fleet, carriers of the Seventh Fleet. And it's really easy to tell the difference because they have the light colored bar at the top that say CVG, CVG3. You know, their name has that banner. So it's very easy to tell the difference when you're sorting through the counters, which are carriers, and they're going here. Uh, so they can only fly tactical missions, and they're sort of separate from the available aircraft uh, box. So when we eventually get to the point where we have like South Korean airfields, our available aircraft can be swapped or, or can operate technically from South Korean airfields. They can operate from uh, Japan airfields, but the uh, carrier planes will always operate from the 7th Fleet Carriers box. Now speaking of the other reinforcement that we got was our 7th Fleet Marker, which is currently way over here, um, so far away that our camera can't focus on it. Uh, we could either put that in the Yellow Sea Station box or the Sea of Japan Station box. Putting it in the uh, Yellow Sea has the potential to influence Chinese intervention, and so I have chosen to put it in the Sea of Japan Station box with the idea that we may need it to support... Uh, any combats around Busan, which would be the last sort of city standing to avoid the communists winning an automatic victory. So kind of a straightforward thought process there. Nothing too crazy. Uh, but you can see now the air war is going to be very different <laughs> uh, where the, you know, the communists had an opportunity to have a little bit of free reign. The uh, UN forces are going to put up a, a much uh, better uh, force there. Um, okay, so as we look at the next phase is the aircraft repair phase, where we would be rolling a D10 for damaged aircraft and repairing them. Uh, because there are no damaged aircraft, we can sort of skip over that phase this time. And now we get to the uh, Air Force commitment phase. So first the Communist player, then the UN player assigns missions to available aircraft, uh, either tactical or strategic. Um, and so I guess the first decision point we're going to have to think through here is, do we send, do we send our poor communist aircraft into the air to contend against all of this? Um, well, maybe, maybe worth a shot just to see it in action, right? We want to see, uh, we want to see some planes fighting. So let's, let's go take a look at the communist air display. Okay, so let's assign our communist air forces uh, the way that this will work is that um, 
Uh, you can have two aircraft launch from an airfield. Uh, and we just have the one, but it is an improved airfield. So both of those planes could operate from the, the one singular airfield that we have. Uh, because we have assigned or we improved it to a improved airfield, that allows us to assign an aircraft to a strategic mission. So you must have a improved airfield to do a strategic mission, according to the rules at 7.6.2. Um, so with that in mind, what do we want to do? Uh, well, we really only have a couple of a couple of options. Um, our IL-10 can really just do uh, tactical missions or strategic missions. And I'm not sure it's even worthwhile to try to airfield strike any airfields in Japan because I'm not even sure we can do it, to be honest. Um, Yeah, I'm trying to look, and I'm not sure if I can. Yeah, I don't know. I So I think what maybe to make this easiest, I mean, it, the, try to have this guy bomb an airfield in Japan, I feel like that's not going to work. Um I don't think that's going to work. So I think what we want to do uh, is assign this guy to ground support again. And we're going to have our uh, Yak operate in MIG Alley. So he's not a MIG by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, his value is only a 2 compared to a MIG's for... Uh, or a three, four, or more, uh, but something is better than nothing, and we will at least contest the skies, and maybe we'll get really lucky with our die rolls. So, um, now technically, what I should have said is both of these guys are going to operate from this airfield. We have two units, one airfield, and it's an improved airfield, which allows us to uh, set it up like so. And we could opt to do one of these, but I don't think, I don't think that's what we want. Um, I think we want ground support still, because we're going to need as much support as we can to try to wrap up the South Korean forces as easily as we can uh, without, now we don't have surprise, but we need to kill those South Korean units in order to, uh, you know, take ownership of the, of, of the South, I guess, right? That's my thinking. So there you go. Their assignment is complete. Uh, and now the UN player will have to do something similar. Okay, so here, okay, so here is the uh, Allied Air <laughs> assignment, and boy, they just have a lot more going on, don't they? Uh, now, a couple of things, um, as it is denoted way down here, uh, certain types of aircraft operating from uh, Japanese airfields are treated as long range. That's F eighty six, F eighty, and F eighty four. We just had um, a couple of those that uh, we were using, and they wound up up here in MIG Alley in the long range box. So they will suffer some penalty to their ability for that, but um, not a big deal. Uh, we have a number of our uh, carrier forces also in MIG Alley, so we're just going to swarm that one poor North Korean unit. We have our B. 29s uh, set up for infrastructure striking, so we're going to try to knock down the uh, North Korean supply and, uh, supply capability, and we have one, our B-26, uh, allocated for airfield striking, believing uh, we should be able to knock out uh, that airfield with just the one unit, we hope, we think, maybe. Um, we're not as concerned if the airfield stays in, in capability, because we're just going to shoot uh, those Korean planes down, I think. Uh, then for tactical missions, we have three planes assigned to uh, ground support and one assigned to interdiction, and that is uh, the carrier plane. 
So focusing a lot more on trying to beef up the South Korean forces in any defenses they're involved in with air support to kind of contest it. And if we can, we may try to interdict something just to try it out and to slow uh, the North Koreans down. So there we go uh, with that. Um, and so the next part of the, the phase now that we've assigned these is to determine air support. So both players add up their tactical missions abilities of their aircraft in the ground support box in its long range box. Uh, and we place our air support counter on that place there. So for the UN, we have an F uh, for you. That's a three value. 51 is a four value and another 51 is another four value. So altogether that's 11. So air support for the UN player is uh, 11 on the uh, chart over here. So you can see, boom, on the 11. That's a lot. That's a fair bit. And uh, the I'm not going to show it on camera, but the communists are going to go ahead and put theirs on uh, the 4 spot like they did in the other turn. Okay, so, uh, okay, so now that we're done with that, we can start uh, dealing with the strategic air missions phase of the monthly turn. So all the rest of these actions are going to start to... Um, resolve our air assignments and that will dictate the sort of air situation for the rest of the month. Um, I've brought over the communist unit that is in the MIG alley box here so we can just conduct our air combat uh, in one place on camera. So yeah, yeah, uh, uh, the poor communist air force being outnumbered quite a bit by, uh, by UN forces. So the way this is going to work uh, is we're going to have an air-to-air -air combat and the aircraft with the highest air-to-air -air ability fires first. Um, and it's most definitely not the Yak, uh, that's for sure. So let's see, we have a bunch of the F9s, so that is a, a 3 value. We also have the uh, F84 which has a 3, minus 1 is a 2, and F80, which is a 3, minus 1 is a 2. So um, really, it's going to be all these guys are going to fire, and then uh, and then it'll be one of these guys, then the communist, then one of these guys. So it's very likely we're going to potentially see uh, the... UN forces shoot down the communists before they even have a chance to, to fire back. Um, okay, so we're going to fire once for each aircraft. We're going to roll a D10, and if we roll equal to or less than their air-to-air -air ability, the enemy target is damaged. Uh, we would flip it to its reduced side and place it in the damaged aircraft box for that side. Um, and if you remove all enemy aircraft from their MiG alley box through air-to-air -air combat, you gain a victory point. Okay, well, there you go. Um, all right, so first things first. This guy is going to fire. He needs a three uh, or less to shoot down the communist. Now I rolled a seven, so he missed. Uh, next, we go with this guy, CVG5, same thing. Also a miss, this guy. Ugh, just missed. I got a four. Uh, this guy is going to have to roll a 2 or less, which seems unlikely, but we'll see. Ooh, we rolled a 1. So uh, that will shoot down this guy. So he's going to become flipped to his reduced side, and he will go off uh, to the uh, damaged aircraft box. So a couple of things. So now he doesn't even get to fire back is how I read these rules. So um, that the ally succeeded, eliminated this unit. Um, and now uh, your aircraft may also conduct free attacks on enemy aircraft. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's just pause for a second. I'm going to send this guy to the damaged uh, air, uh, damaged aircraft box flip and we're going to give the UN player a victory point uh, because they have cleared the MIG alley box of their opponent. Okay, so uh, 
with the MIG Alley stuff complete, uh, the units go back to available. So I have returned them to their uh, to their boxes. Um, I wanted to make sure I took out that one guy, but maybe what should have happened is we had had them assigned to top cover, um, or at least some of these UN forces assigned to top cover. Because if you win in MIG Alley, you don't get to, you know because there was a fight at all. They don't get to drop down to top cover. They have to go home. If for some reason the communists didn't put their fighter craft in Megali and we had assigned the UN forces up here, they would have gotten to just drop down to top cover. But my reading of the rules seems to indicate that uh, when the fight is over, any of the remnant planes do not get to drop down automatically to top cover. So we, we maybe should have assigned some for this purpose. And, you, and, and top cover is essentially kind of like escort duty or... A, a level of interception that is different than Megali controlling the skies and air superiority. So we sort of missed the chance there, uh, but I'm sure it'll it'll be made up for. Um, okay, so uh, now we are going to have our infrastructure bombing take place. So these guys, these are all our B-29, so a 4 or less is ideally what we want to be rolling on a D-6. So instead of a D-10, we have a D-6, and we'll roll for the first one. We rolled a four, uh, so that is sufficient, I believe. Yes, so that would decrease the infrastructure of the communists by one, from a 12 to 11, uh, and we'll roll for the second plane. We rolled a two, which reduces it down again, and then rolling again, and another two. Okay, so we were three for three, and the communist uh, infrastructure is now down to 9 from 12. That's pretty significant. And now that we're done, all these guys will go back to available. Pretty straightforward stuff. Then we have our B-26 doing an airfield strike. Um, so there are modifiers. Really, there are modifiers for all of these. They just didn't affect. So for the infrastructure strike, uh, minus 1 if in the long-range box. That wasn't the case. Minus 1 if the weather was rainy. Minus two of winter month, those did not apply. Same would apply here, but again, uh, they don't apply. So we're just going to roll the die, a d6, and we just want to avoid rolling a six, basically. And I rolled another two. Uh, so uh, that, uh, let's see, equal to or less than a strategic mission's ability. So yeah, we would have a, we needed a three or less, we rolled a two. Uh, damage the target airfield. Or improved airfield. Place the airfield in the damaged airfield box for its location. Um, so in this case, uh, because we uh, completed that, um, we will move the aircraft on uh, the airfield on the communist display to damage. I'll do that off camera since it's on all the way on the other side of the table. Um, and then we have sort of the final phase here. We have top cover phase. So um, if neither player has aircraft in the top cover box, then this phase is complete. So that's it. So it only took us for it only took us forever, uh, but we are now done with the monthly phase. So monthly phase is complete. Um, we are left with uh, a North Korea that has suffered some infrastructure damage. We've seen. The uh, Allies sort of take control of the skies. They got a MIG alley victory point, uh, which reduces the Communist victory point to three. Uh, and there is plenty of air support for ground combats, but no uh, opportunities for real interception uh, just based on my aircraft allocation. So possibly a mistake that I focus so much on MIG alley. Uh, maybe could have afforded to put a couple planes down here, but I didn't do it. So we'll, uh, we'll address that probably in next turn. We'll try to do that more. Um, but let's get it figured out to do the uh, weekly turn. So we're going to start the weekly phases, and um, let's just skip past a couple of things, right? Fleet deployment, I'm going to leave the 7th Fleet in the Sea of Japan box. There's no amphibious invasion. Uh, I do not currently want to do any sea evacuation. Uh, so we're going to have some reinforcements, and yes, there are going to be uh, some reinforcements to look at, so let's see what we get. Okay, so now we're at the reinforcements phase of the weekly turn. 
And this is our first opportunity to really see what that looks like. So uh, the U.S. Navy bombardment uh, gets placed on the four uh, spot because we get four bombardment support. So that's where that goes. So uh, improvements for the U.N. forces for sure. We also get a task force unit in any supply source box, and I've chosen to put it off uh, the uh, box up here near Incheon. And the task force uh, marker, which, I mean, there's a couple task forces markers in the game. This is a U.S. unit. Um, they are very weak. There's some special rules for them uh, towards the back of the rulebook. They are very weak. They don't do a whole lot. They're really there as a delaying action or to plug a hole with having a unit. They are removed if they're forced to retreat or lose a combat, basic, or they can't retreat. So basically, you know, if they lose a combat, they're just removed. So they're just there as a delaying force. And uh, the existing unit in the game is based off of Task Force Smith as the sort of historical uh, historical version of what that is. Um I think historically they wound up down here and moved north, but because we still control Inchon at the moment, um, I think I might try to use it to block this objective marker maybe or something. I'm not really sure. Uh, uh, again, now, now that I'm concerned about where objective markers are allowed to be placed, I'm not sure what I want to do. Um, so I'm going to try to delay them up there and just make Seoul harder to take, I guess. Uh, that, that's my thought process. Um, here is also where we can look at rebuilding eliminated units, but this is where it gets a little tricky. So if we want to uh, get reinforcements, what we need to do is spend replacement points, right? So we have some that we got for uh, uh, our foreign aid, and we have two eliminated South Korean units in the replacements box. So if we wanted to get another unit on the board, and I think it would be probably a good idea to do that, um, we would need to, uh, let's see, we need to spend one replacement point per unit, and because we can use UN replacements uh, for any UN unit, including South Korea, I believe, we can spend one replacement and we can restore a unit and put it uh, like we got it as a reinforcement, so basically in a supply box. But we have to take the other unit, and you have to have two in here to be able to restore one unit. One goes in the, the destroyed box. So you can kind of see this as you are slowly going to lose units over time, um, because when you rebuild them, you only get to rebuild half, and you need to have two to rebuild one at all. So this guy goes into the destroyed box, and we will place this guy... Uh, somewhere, and I and I think what I want to do is I just look at the position on the map. I'm going to put this guy in. I think we'll put him in the uh, Pusan uh, UN supply box here, as you can see. Um, and that is it for uh, the. UN reinforcement phase. So now we go to the communists, but you can see, you know, we didn't we didn't get a whole lot in this reinforcement phase. There wasn't a whole lot for us to, to do. Um, a couple of very basic minor things, but that will change over time as more stuff uh, becomes available and all that goodness. So let's go take a look at the communist display. Okay, so first thing for reinforcements for the communists. Uh, let's just take care of our player aid sheet first. We do get more units, but uh, we'll do that last. We're going to add one artillery support level, so we go up to five artillery support. We get one tank level, so that goes up to seven. And then we add three North Korean replacement points. So our replacement was at eight. We are now up to 11. Um, and that's it. So these are just very basic uh, reinforcements coming in automatically onto uh, the adjustments on our player aid sheet. And now in any supply space, we're going to place four North Korean uh, combat units. Okay, so here's the uh, North Korean reinforcements. I am putting all four up here in this uh, communist supply source. So all of the communist supply sources are like way up here on the border of China. Um, 
you don't get to place them in Pyongyang or something. Uh, they're, they're all the way up here. Um, and I am going to stack them all here. Uh, you are allowed to stack fresh units, more than one per hex. So at least for the moment, they're going to be able to uh, head on south following the roads. Um, as I'm recording this, I had gotten some comments around, uh, well, stuff on my last video that I've explained already, which is I, I know how combat works and my activation of singular units has a purpose. Um, but there was one interesting thing where somebody was saying, uh, Doug, who's, who's done blog posts on this game, says that towns cost one movement point um, even with roads to enter. And I don't know that I agree with that. Um, I, don't, I, I don't agree with that interpretation of the rules. The, the terrain effects chart says that roads and railroads negate other terrain uh, for, for movement. And towns are another terrain. Um, it's a terrain type. So if I read the terrain effects chart correctly, and this did not receive errata to my knowledge, uh, the only piece of errata that was made was enemy Zox negate roads for movement was deleted. That's not uh, that's not the case. But, but everything that I've seen in the rules seems to still indicate that you ignore or you treat towns as half a movement point if you're moving along the road through the town. Hex. That, that's my interpretation, so I would not do, like, one, if I were moving these guys south, right? Like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It would be, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so and so forth. Um, I, there, there's a comment about how agrarian the, the country was and that getting through towns was tougher, I, I, that I'm, I'm sure is the case, um, but the rules do not seem to go with that interpretation. Uh, and as best as I can tell, I should treat towns as half a movement cost. Now, that, you know, if I entered uh, this, let's see if I can find a good example. If I entered this hex from th this hex, um, or I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, this hex, if I entered this hex from here and there's no road connection, I would agree you would have to account for all the different terrain, one for the town and then two more for the river, or if entering this hex from one of these hexes, it would cost one. I agree with that. But 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 again, based on how I read the rules here, um, the roads and railroads make the town still cost half a movement point. That, that's how I'm going to continue to play it until I see or hear otherwise, or I can be provided a link that explains it. So... Maybe that exists somewhere in Consum World. I've not seen it, or it's a comment or something on Board Game Geek, but I do not recall seeing that. So I'm going to continue to play it as I've played it. Uh, okay, so reinforcements are done. What do we do next? Well, reinforcements are complete. Um, the North Koreans didn't have any units to rebuild, so they're good to go. Uh, so now we have UN communications phase. So. Do all of our UK units have a line of communication? Um, based on what I can see, yes, they do. Even this guy out here, I believe, can trace along the road. Um, I believe that to be the case. Maybe I need to make sure of it. Um, I don't think there's anything that's going to stop that. What can block a line of communication is enemy controlled hexes, but here's the thing. Um, as far as I know, nothing has occurred that would um, trace the line of communication hex by hex from the H here unit to supply source. The trace may enter up to three hexes until reaching a road, road or town. From there, you trace back. Now, enemy-controlled hexes can block a line of communication. I don't know, because there's no control markers, like, did, did somehow the communists take control of these roads and now I can't use them? I, I don't know. But I, it's not like I'm... It's not clear that this would be enemy-controlled territory, so I have to assume that South Koreans can still use the road here. So everybody on map that I can see... Uh, is able to trace 
a line of communication. Even this guy over here, because he's tracing down this way, um, and this unit blocks that Zoc, and so it can trace back towards Inchon. So I think we're good there, no worries. Uh, and then we at last have a refresh phase. So the UN player refreshes his combat units, but not HQs by flipping the counters from their spent side to their fresh side. So we get to do that for everybody. These guys down in the south, that's true for our elite unit and Tejan gets that. This capital unit gets that. Um, I believe this routed unit even gets it, though he's in rough shape. Um, and our last guy over here gets it. Well, that's the case. Only other gotcha would be something with the routed unit. Um, routed units don't have Zocks. Remove the marker when an HQ activates it. But they do nothing but remove that marker. Blah, 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 blah. But he can still be refreshed, it looks like. So I think we're good there. And... Okay, now we're back to the communists. So, so all the UN got to do over all of this is they, they found out that the U.S. is sending air support and a task force, uh, and they become fresh, but they've got a whole host of other problems, uh, and they don't even get their, any strategic movement until after the communists have all gotten to go. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do a strategic movement for all of our communist guys, and then uh, I'm Probably, because this video is probably already quite long, I'm going to go ahead and start doing HQ activations off camera, and I will return us to camera if something really interesting has occurred or something I, I really specifically want to talk about uh, comes up. So let's see what happens. Okay, so I wanted to show stuff on camera to kind of show where we're at mid-activations. I've got one guy... Who was flying down the road this way um, and is beyond the Pusan perimeter at the moment. Uh, I've got one guy who just flew down this way via this HQ that's been refreshed and he's outside Tejan. I haven't activated any of these guys yet, uh, but over here I've left this guy unactivated for the moment, but I did activate this unit to have, uh, and by the way, I, I I've gone ahead and refreshed him ahead just because it's easier for me to spend it then. Um, don't mind me. Uh, but I do have a prepared attack occurring here against uh, that unit, and it's going to get some support, and that unit is um, going to have a line of communication problems. So the chit that I drew, and I only got to draw the one chit, and it's what we are going to have to use is a... D10, minus 1, a C support, and a advance 1 marker. So, um, imperfect, but that's what we have. And I wanted to show this combat on camera, or at least the calculation, because uh, we're dealing with a lot of different elements here. So, we are attacking uh, hills terrain, which means there's no tank support. We have a C uh, support readiness, so our artillery is at a 5 for the communists. Minus two because of the C is a three, but in hills, you get a two for one. So we can only buy one die roll modifier. So that's a plus one. We're going to have a supporting unit. So we get a plus one for that. So, so far, plus, uh, plus two. Um, and then uh, we we're I was trying to figure out, do we use air support here? And I think we tried, right? So the way the, this is going to work is the uh, readiness rating for air on a C, a C support is a 2, so we take 4 minus 2, and it's a 2. Uh, and then uh, in Hill's Terrain, it's a 2 for 1, so we would get another plus 1. So we were allocating, basically, this guy to the combat. Now, there's no interception that's going to occur, and so uh, we'll basically get that plus 1. We will have to determine if that guy's going to stay on station. Um, uh, 
And I'm going to have to figure out when we roll for that stay on station. It doesn't quite matter yet. Now, the same thing is going to be for the allies now. So we are functionally, uh, when we account for the plus one for artillery, plus one for support, and plus one for air support, uh, we have for the chit the minus one. So we're at a D10 plus two. Uh, this elite unit that is present is uh, fresh, which means they're going to have a D10. Because they don't have a line of communication, they can't use uh, armor or tank, or I'm sorry, tank or artillery. And um, we are far enough away from the coast that the Allies don't get shore bombardment advantage either. So really, their only option is to use air support, which does not require a line of communication. Uh, now, because this is a prepared attack, the uh, allies are going to lose uh, three from uh, three from their total, which would be an eleven. So their eleven minus three is eight. So we could use eight uh, as our sort of maximum. And so then we have to look at the actual planes to see, uh, can we get that many in? Um, so it looks like we would have to send our 51s in for the 8. So we'll place these guys over here. Uh, and so that 8, and it's going to be a 2 for 1. And so uh, that's a plus 4. For the die roll. So this is actually a pretty interesting combat where, like, all together it's a d10 plus two for the communists, and because of the overwhelming air support uh, for this combat, at least, because I wanted this to be an interesting demonstration, um, they're going to use two of their planes to provide, uh, they were able to get two of their planes in uh, for... Let's make sure I'm counting this right, actually. Yeah, they were able to get their eight factors in there. And... Adjustments, didn't know. And once you have to purchase DRMs. So yeah, this, this is where it really makes a significant difference. And then on top of that, and I really should not forget about this, the hills have a further plus three uh, to the die roll. So um, this is going to make it uh, pretty rough. A 1d10 plus seven for the allies. So this is actually going to be a combat where the North Koreans are going to have uh, some problems, I think. Um, The defending unit is fresh, even if it's got no uh, line of communication. Yeah, okay. Well, this is kind of interesting, guys. It's going to be a interesting set of die rolls. Um, so again, <laughs> a D10 plus 2 for the communists and a D10 plus uh, seven for the UN, and we'll roll it, and what did we get? Oof. Well, um, we got a 10 as a uh, natural 10, so we get a guards unit, and then the uh, communists have a 12, so they maxed out, uh, and the allies, or the UN, has a 15, so that is a 3, uh, three loss factors for the communists. Um, let's see. Well, I think we're going to pay one replacement point. That's easy. So then we have to lose two more. Um, 
And, you know, I think we'll go ahead and... Let's see. Two, 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 two. Um, huh. Maybe, maybe we spend it off victory points. There you go. Okay. So that's it for that particular combat. Um, and I just need to figure out what happens with the planes because I think they need to roll on station. Uh, to stay on station at this point in the action, but let me double check that. Um, because I think. Yeah, I'm really not sure when that's supposed to occur. Um, There's no advance after combat, uh, there's no exploitation movement, and we return things to the cup, and check stacking, and we already refreshed the HQ. So, um, I will have to figure out, I'll take myself off camera and I'll try to figure out what to do with the, uh, the planes. Okay, so the um, the rules are not super clear on this, but the example of play seems to be uh, in the 3.0 rules, where after you've designated a unit for ground support, and to me this makes sense, like this should just be the rule, but I believe it is missing clearly from the 3.0 rules and needs to be amended with errata, uh, is that uh, air units sent for ground support and actually supporting an air combat need a roll to stay on station or return to the available box. So... Uh, we'll roll for the communists first. They need to roll a 2 or less on a d6. So we'll roll for that uh, IL-10. And we fail. So this unit will go to available aircraft, I believe. Um, I think that's how that works. Uh, and then similarly, the allies would have to roll for their two units. And they need a four or less for each. So they'll roll uh, for the first, they got it, and then roll for the second, they got it. So both of the UN planes will go back to uh, the ground support box, which means they can continue to provide, provide ground support throughout uh, this month and this turn. But the communists are currently out of air power which is going to be, I think, a pretty significant, uh, a pretty significant issue for, uh, for those guys. So, um, yeah, I guess what the communists got out of that is that they gained a guards unit, but they gave up some victory points, uh, to do it. Now, again, back to the whole victory point thing, maybe you want the UN to have victory points. I don't know. Um, but there you go. So that, that combat, I think, was worth taking the time to walk through because it did involve air support. And now we can keep in mind that the UN can continue to provide air support throughout the month, but it looks like uh, the communists have failed to stay on station and the Yak bombers are uh, going back home to, uh, to an airfield. So, or, you know, back, back to available, it seems like. So um, there you go. I'm going to continue to uh, perform the rest of the communist activations and we'll see what things look like uh, when we're done there. I will point out that as a part of previous movement, I had displaced a rock HQ, and it now can no longer do reserve movement. Uh, and these guys can't do reserve movement, this HQ, because it is an Azok of a communist unit. So uh, the Allies still having a lot of trouble being able to move and adapt and do things uh, as it happens. So, okay, um, I'm going to continue doing operations. We'll come back and we'll see where things stand. Okay, so here we are after the uh, communists have finished their activations. So we, I didn't get very far. Um, these guys uh, that were um, strategically moved down from the north managed to move forward to these areas. I've made sure to refresh all of my uh, HQs because I will need them to continue operating. Problem is, I'm low on supply. I've used a whole lot of supply trying to do what I did before, which was use activations to kind of open it up. And I'm, my problem 
I will say. Uh, and, and I did do supporting attacks against this capital unit in Seoul. The Allied air has just been freaking on fire. Um, they've managed to stay on station uh, for most combats. So they've provided a good amount of support, and they get a lot. Um, they have a lot of air support, and it has made up for any of the advantages of the North Koreans. And we've gotten to the point now where it's like, I, I am having a hard time taking Seoul and, and have, in fact, had a unit disrupted because I had to retreat. I've given up victory points, uh, and I've given up replacements. So I'm down to eight replacements. Um, we're down to zero victory points, um, and that's just from us slamming our head against some of these combats. So we did clear the way over here. Um, we are still stuck fighting around Seoul. And then elsewhere, we've moved south near Tejan, and we're heading down the coast that way. Again, I'm playing with the to go through towns through road connections is half a movement point. So like it, I think what my issue is, is I'm bunched up around Seoul and that's a huge problem. I really screwed up making that work. Um, and I'm trying to use my movement for stronger attacks so that I can make up for the air of the allies. But um, yeah, it's not so good. What I may end up just having to do is creating a situation where I can uh, encircle Soul and do some attacks where he's blocked out of communication. But because I did not do that, um, I'm, I'm really bunched up. So this is probably a huge failure on my part this turn as the communist is not taking Soul or knocking out that last unit. And every time that air support just made the difference and because they stay on station i could keep using them and they kept staying on station so air power is huge it's such a huge deal um such a huge deal i mean the the south koreans now only have three units on the board to a lot more as the north koreans but if they can hold on a soul who knows what right what i'll probably end up doing is is just working my way down here uh trying to take busan trying to take these different areas um, but needing to figure out, like, where are we going to go as the Allies, right? So that's sort of the next part of the turn, is the Allied stuff. So I've done the Communist refresh phase. Um, that's as good as it gets for the moment. Uh, but now we have the UN Strategic Movement. Um, I think, uh, I believe, I'm going to be able to move my task force out for this. Um, So I think I can just do like this, and he pops into Inchon for strategic movement. I guess I can move. I can move up to here even, um, I guess. Depends on if that task force has uh, the Zoc or not. Looks like they do. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to move this guy here. I'm going to leave this guy there. Um, and let's see can't do anything with these guys because they're stuck in Zox. Um, one, two, three. Okay, so with the UN strategic movement done, we've got these guys set up like so. Um, I think that's all I want to do. Um, 
You can see just bare, just just barely we have something of a line here with four units. Um, so yeah, I actually had more units than I said I did than three. We have one, two, three, four units, uh, five units on the map right now as the North Koreans. Um, and now we have the activation phase. So let's see, one of our HQs was displaced and so I can't activate very much. Um, I can try to activate this HQ. But boy, that's going to be a really tough activation um, because it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I don't even think I can activate anybody, honestly. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, I don't think I can, as the UN, I don't think I can activate anybody, honestly. Um, I, yeah, I, I, what I could do is I could activate this guy to try to attack, but I'm not even sure that's valuable to try. Uh, we now only have one more plane on air station, and that's not going to be enough to contest the uh, North Korean advantages in most of these places. So I think what I could do, gosh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe the UN doesn't do anything. Maybe they just hold on. We're, we're just trying to be roadblocks. So uh, we'll say the UN activation phase is complete. Let's just say it's complete. Um, so reset phase, eliminate friendly units phase. I don't think anyone's going to do that. Uh, victory phase. So here's what I think. Here's what I think is going to happen. I think uh, the communists are going to place an objective marker here in Seoul that is controlled by the South Koreans. So underneath that HQ, um, and the Allies are going to uh, the UN player is going to remove an objective over here. That was three victory points taken off the board. Um, so as it stands right now, there's not very many uh, communist objectives on the map. And there you go. So that's, that's all she wrote. Um, and then we advance to the second week. It's only the second week. And the communists have already burned through a huge amount of their uh, supplies. So yeesh, maybe I'm screwing this up. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, um, so that's it for turn two, guys. Uh, this is probably a long video, mostly having to do with the um, uh, having mostly having to do with the uh, goofy uh, monthly phase that we took care of. But uh, there you go. So I'm I'm fouling up as the North Koreans. That's the current situation. But okay, guys. Well, thanks for watching. Uh, we'll see you in the next one for turn three, which would be week two of July 1950. Uh, see you guys in the next one. Take care. Keep on gaming.